and we're ready. Hi there, can anyone hear me? Oh yes, I, I assume you can. Just one second. <clears throat> uh, hello everyone. Um, uh, good morning. And uh, my name is John Sproul and um, I, along with Coralie, Karen's are gonna be the service leaders this morning for the um, service for the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. We'd like to welcome you. Um, to this online Zoom church service. And um, uh, we'll just begin. We are a welcoming congregation. And this means our community is open to all without regard to race, gender, sexual orientation, age, or income. And uh, you are all welcome here. We'd especially like to welcome any visitors who might be with us today who are new. I think most of the people online have been on before, but if there are any visitors, I um, invite you to join us for conversation in the breakout rooms after the service has ended and you're also welcome to go online to the guest book which you can find at uce.ca uh, and all information on future services. Um, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton gathers with gratitude on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. We'll begin this service with a prelude. Uh, and this service came about because John Pater was talking to me, and this normally would be a time for the Fringe Theatre Festival. Right this week um, is when it would be taking place, and thought it was an apt topic for today's service uh, and um, Corley and I are both, um, she more than me, but involved as actors and performers. And so this was an important kind of celebration week, which unfortunately is, is having to be deterred. And we're just gonna be providing some music and words. And so hope you can sit back and remember some of the inspirational and perhaps spiritual times you may have had in the theater. And certainly Unitarians are great theater goers. This selection's from a musical that both Corley and I saw separately, actually, in around 1973 in London, uh, when we were much younger. And uh, it was a musical Godspell, which happened at the time to star, we, we learned afterwards, a very young Jeremy Irons playing, playing uh, Judas in the production. And it seems a little Christian, actually, now that I reflect on it, um, and because I'm not sure all good gifts uh, that are brought to us, Unitarians would all praise, uh, come from the Lord, but it's a, a, a beautiful song, um, and so just wanted to, people sit back and listen as a prelude. scatter the good seed on the land but it is fed in water sorry i've just got to go back <laughs> sorry i'm just going to close this because, uh, and I have to, I'm going to start again. Um, oh, now I closed the thing. So just one, um, I have to open up.
we'll go to try again. And I'm going to share the screen and here we go. I'm going to try once more. Refreshing rain All good gifts around us Are sent from heaven above Then thank the Lord Oh, thank the Lord For His love Here are just some opening words from a quite different uh, play as far as the sentiment about God. Um, and it's from Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godo, which uh, if I, you haven't read, I would encourage you to read. It's um, basically, it's a very bleak and existential view of our relationship to the universe and whether there might be something divine. And two lonely men are standing by a tree waiting for Gado, which is a pun which has some obvious um, um, background. 
And it captures the longing of all of us waiting for some meaning or understanding or collective unconscious or God. And the visitor that uh, the two lonely men meet is Potso, who ends up stating, one day we were born, one day we will sh shall die, the same day, the same second. Is that not enough for you? We give birth astride of a grave. The light gleams an instant, then it's night once more. And there's images in the play in which the, say, the grave digger is holding forceps. So our time on earth is a very existential kind of passing one. And so it's quite a different uh, kind of perspective, but a lot of um, plays I find present religious views that are sometimes <laughs> connected with organized religion and sometimes just philosophical views about, about the world. And in the play, the two characters uh, later in the play I think describe a lot of human uh, existence. Estragon says, I can't go on like this, simply waiting for God. And Vladimir says, that's what you think. <laughs> and so that's um, uh, just some early thinking. Now we just have a kindling of the chalice. I would encourage you if you do have chalices at home to join in lighting your own one for uh, uh, today as we begin the service. The uh, Unitarian Church is a self-governing and self-supporting community, and we rely on donations to support our staffs and programs. During this unprecedented time, we need um, your financial support more than ever to maintain the connections with members and with friends. And so you can visit the website, which is noted here, uce.ca, for more information on how to donate uh, virtually and they have the Canada Helps and ATD Cares there, so I'd encourage you to do that. Now, each Sunday, we collect money for a different charity. Uh, for the month, uh, and this has um, been more difficult since we haven't been in person to, to share the half collection of the money collected at the service. For the month of August, the UCE has identified the Boyle Street Community Services as an organization, and so I just encourage you to take some time to send some financial support if you're willing and able to do so, either to the church or the identified uh, charity. And now traditionally, if um, people are muted, but they can sing along to the, um, uh, from you, I receive. <laughs> Now, um, just to begin, we um, didn't want to be totally um, Christian in the kind of the presentation of, of material on the play. So we selected some music from a musical with a religious theme. Uh, it's not a Christian one. It's from the Book of Mormon. Um, and Corley and I had the pleasure of seeing this live in Chicago. And if people haven't had the opportunity to see it, it's, uh, it's a fantastic production. And this particular song is, is sung by Nubalinga, who is a young girl from Uganda. The play is about a group of Mormon missionary, missionaries going to Africa who kind of describe the, trying to proselytize uh, with uh, the Ugandan um, uh, people. And there's a young girl who, in speaking to the uh, young uh, white missionaries, uh, hears about this wonderful place, which she just sees as heavenly and, and a place of heaven on, on, on earth. And it's Salt Lake Ka City. And this is the uh, uh, song, and it's a very, um, uh, the play is a powerful and hysterical um, kind of satire. But here, is Salt Lake Ka City. And a bit outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> My mother once told me of a place with waterfalls and beautiful lights. 
We're now going to have a um, reading, and when thinking about theater and religion, uh, it's more than just organized religions proselytizing their stories on the stage or commentaries on organized religion that become the subject matter of, of key works of um, uh, theater and by playwrights. But also there's presentation in theater about alternative ways to connect us with the luminous and the universal. And artists are often a step ahead of philosophers in helping us understand our universe and bring some common meaning through imagery and story. And there was a very powerful play written by Tony Kushner in the early 1990s called Angels in America. And it was in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, and it was a comment on the Reagan administration and their response. And there's a character, Harper, uh, a woman who is flying on a plane looking out a window. And she reflects what I find to be a very Unitarian sentiment. And it's the idea of soul, uh, faith in the collective human connection, and a bit of commentary, early commentary, frankly, on, on the environment and, and the pressing kind of crisis. But uh, uh, Corley's just gonna read that now. 
just a second. I've got to move. Okay. Night flight to San Francisco. Chase the moon across America. God, it's been years since I was on a plane. When we hit 35,000 feet, we'll have reached the tropopause, the great belt of calm air as close as I'll ever get to the ozone. I dreamed we were there. The plane leapt the tropopause, the safe air, and attained the outer rim, the ozone, which was ragged and torn, patches of it threadbare as old cheesecloth. And that was frightening. But I saw something that only I could see because of my astonishing ability to see such things. Souls were rising from the earth far below, souls of the dead, of people who had perished from famine, from war, from the plague, and they floated up like skydivers in reverse, limbs all akimbo, wheeling and spinning. And the souls of these departed joined hands clasped the ankles and formed a web, a great net of souls. And the souls were three atom oxygen molecules of the stuff of ozone, and the outer rim absorbed them and was repaired. Nothing's lost forever. In this world, there's a kind of painful progress, longing for what we left behind and dreaming ahead. At least, I think so. And now we're just going to have a time of uh, candles and uh, of care and connection. And so um, it's an uh, important part of our <coughs> community is the sharing of joys and sorrows. And I invite anyone who wishes to, to light a candle by making a comment in the chat function, or you can certainly send your chair, care and concerns to the uh, candles at uc.ca. But if people want to comment, um, and uh, you can certainly comment on your favorite fringe play that you might have had or what you might be wish wishing from the particular kind of theater at this particular kind of moment. But uh, first of all, we'll have a, a moment of silence. Uh, and then um, going to be playing uh, the theme music, which occurred actually Coralie's during the HBO production of Angels in America that was associated with the scene that Coralie just read about the tropopause and the network of souls that might be able to rise, uh, who might have died from the plague to, to go up and, and repair it. But first we'll have a, uh, a short moment of silence and then um, uh, play some music for reflection. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, um, just uh, before I proceed, I will light two more virtual candles um, on everyone's behalf. One is, and a number of you have noted, in honor of the fringe for all the lonely performers right now and the lonely audience members seeking connection at this time. And also another one for the joys and sorrows that were unspoken today that reside in, in uh, people's hearts and dwell in all our hearts. And so we want to acknowledge those. Uh, now I just, um, when we were uh, looking at information of the relationship between kind of theater and, and religion, uh, uh, Corley found a, a great uh, kind of editorial kind of article, which was written by uh, Mark Shea. It was from the Catholic World Report. Um, and actually it's about the church and the stage. And she poses, uh, 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 he poses a thought experiment, which, which uh, Corley could share with you now. <laughs> you enter a ritual space and take your seat in the midst of a large audience at the front or perhaps the middle of the hall, often vast and airy, but sometimes small and intimate, is another part of the ritual space that is marked off from the area you and your fellow audience members occupy. In that ritual space are various pieces of furniture and props for use during the public act, which is about to occur. Music sounds, a chorus and a cat of ritually costumed figures appear and begin to go through a set of carefully scripted words and physical actions. There is a place in the script for audience involvement, with a call and response between the figures in the ritual space and the audience. Various cast members recite words of poetry and pose and sometimes burst into song. One player in particular portrays in a stylized form the central hero of the drama. The tale of a conflict in which the hero passes through all the trials of life with which we ourselves are familiar. Poverty, hunger, friendship, love, betrayal, suffering, and death, and comes at last to a glorious and moving triumph. It is a tale in which, after a struggle and a grand act of self-sacrifice, the hero saves his friends from the powers of evil, the humble are exalted, and the bad guys get their comeuppets, or are themselves so changed by the conflict that they are reconciled with the hero in friendship and love. In the end, the hero receives his reward and the acclaim of great and small. Through participation in this drama, all involved have offered to them a chance at catharsis, <laughs> purging from the ills, spiritual and physical, which burden them as human beings. The audience members become participants in mysterious realities revealed in and through words that are made flesh before their eyes, and they experience a sense of contact with something transcendent. At the conclusion, all depart, and the stylized ritual concludes. So here's the pop quiz. Are you in a production of a play by Sophocles or at Mass? <laughs> So that's an interesting kind of question, the experience, and um, just put up a picture of uh, a theater from, uh, uh, actually it's from New York, and then a large church, and they're extremely um, uh, similar. So just wanted to uh, provide a few comments um, and reflections, and it was interesting, I was walking in my neighborhood earlier in the summer, and I bumped into uh, former Edmonton Journal columnist Sheila Pratt and she lamented to me the closing of all the theater production. She'd actually seen the last show of our abruptly stopped shadow theater season. She had, it had run for three days before it was closed in March and she had seen the last performance and I told her it would likely be quite a while before shows commenced again and she said I need them to open theater is my church, because at that time they were talking about allowing churches to be able to remain open, and, and it always it struck me how Sheila had noted, well, that's my church. I go to live theater. I think that's true for many people. 
coming together to have communal theater experiences where ideas and laughter and tears are shared is a regular religious experience for them. And there's something about live performance that has a special quality and connection different than other experiences. Uh, there's really something spiritual about it. For audience, but also for artists, as you attempt to conjure up and create a new reality on stage and in a shared space with others. The conjuring only works in fits and starts. Actually, when you're able to achieve it, I know as an actor, it's only happened about four or five times and I can, I can name, and I've been talking to Corley too, so we can name the four or five times where you're actually in a production where it kind of hits into a place where you go to another particular place, but there's that constant struggle where you're trying to carry people to a new uh, reality. And there are some things which we all generally recognize as beautiful or funny or frightening or evil. Because I, I do remember early thinking about the relationship between art and religion and being brought up as a Unitarian, it wasn't a religious thing. It was about actually this connection to the collective unconscious. And there was a very important book I remember reading about the Golden Bough, which there are some common myths and tales and stories that exist across all cult cultures and most religions and that appeal to our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. And this kind of echoes in religious and non-religious stories. There's the hero's quest. There's the quest myth that exists everywhere. There's the cycle of rebirth and death, which often is matching annual harvest. You know, winter comes, but spring will come again. Uh, lots of flood and similar disaster myths uh, across the world where higher powers get angry at us, and that exists in, in religious and non-religious stories. Now, theater is a, not a high art form, but a craft. In, in many ways, it is, uses vaudeville tricks and let's pretend techniques to present ideas and stories. Modern Western theater is rooted in ancient Greece, actually. And Greek theater had its origins in religious ritual. It, the god Dionysus, often associated with, in modern minds with wine and revelry, was also the god of harvest. Uh, he was twice born, uh, second time from the thigh of Zeus, who was the father of all gods and men. So um, there was a Definite religious connection early in theater. Celebrations occurred annually that were linked to the planting and harvesting in ancient times, uh, right on the floor where the grain would be separated from its stalk. And it was an opportunity to exhibit a Greek love for dance and music and to give thanks for the bountiful harvest. And a lot of theater terms about how a theater is structured are linked back to words that describe the harvesting floor and the threshing floor. Um, and uh, Greek plays took place, they have all take place in the open air at the base of a sloping hillside which provided each tier of seats with an unimpeded view and wooden benches were aligned in a semicircular fashion surrounding the circular centra orchestra space which is still called the orchestra in modern times, the, the base level of the flatter level of, of audience that's closest to the stage in a multi-tiered stage. And in the middle was the altar of Dionysus in the early stage. There was um, a famous individual who's the god of actors, which is Thespis. Uh, uh, according to ancient Greek sources is supposedly the first person to appear on stage as an actor playing a character in a play instead of playing himself. So that was, um, rather than just reciting the uh, words of God or whatever, he actually came and portrayed someone else. And that was, he was deemed to be the first actor. And that's where the term thespian comes from, in which um, uh, all actors, generally the, um, the other term is to be called a thespian. Um, 
Theater did not remain popular, however, after through Greece. And frankly, in terms of religious context, Christian leaders at the, of the early church were clearly against theater. In fact, posed the paganism and debauchery that was associated with it because they felt people copied the immorality of the pagan gods rather than, rather than um, worshiping Christian attitudes. And to them, theater was so shot full with evil, there was, uh, they wanted nothing to do it and they spoke out against it. And it was Christians who pressed right at the end of the Roman Empire to ban theater. Um, so from the time of the early church up until about the 10th century, theater was rejected as pagan and worldly. However, paganism began to decline and Christianity took over. And frankly, then in the Middle Ages became the rise of the passion plays, which were used by the Christian church to, which grew out of church liturgy. Um, and they started be, to be performed. So it was a strange thing that the church banned theater, but then it used theater and resurrected to tell stories about Easter and Christmas. Um, it was just too fun and powerful of a force to not uh, uh, use because theater basically is a mix of vaudeville and let's pretend to be used for all sorts of uh, purposes. And in looking at this topic, there was a great essay I found by a Dr. Norman Burt, which was aptly called Theater and Religion. When I Googled theater and religion, it actually usefully came up. And I wanted to summarize a few thoughts from him and to echo, echo some of the points which Corley raised in her reading. First, uh, about myths. And he states, religion works by creating and reenacting myths. Myths very simply are a complex of what we know and believe about ourselves and our world perceived and expressed as stories. The most powerful components of religion are the stories and the parables. A myth is a metaphor for a mystery beyond human comprehension. It's a comparison that helps us understand by analogy, some aspect of our mysterious selves. A myth is a way of thinking, is not an untruth, but a way of reaching profound truth. The experience of watching theater is similar to the mystical experience that some say can come from religion. A good play arouses reason, emotion, and hunger in a manner that causes all these faculties to transcend themselves. Theatrical catharsis and the mystic experience of religion are actually quite indistinguishable in the, in the kind of um, feeling that it evokes. Theater shares with religion the same love of costumes. And on the slide I, I uh, put up, is just, these are all theatrical costumes, but then there's some costumes just on the bottom right-hand corner, which is the, all the paraphernalia of, of, a, of a group of, of nuns, but both religion and theater love costumes. The same approach to the creation and modification of myths and myth stories of, of tapping into the collective unconscious. An identical setting in community spaces. If you look at um, churches, and, and certainly community theater, often uh, around across North America and Canada, theaters have been founded in old abandoned churches and, and it could work vice versa, but they, they actually have a similar kind of community space, a similar immediacy of people collectively coming together and a parallel scope of attitudes towards the transcendent, trying to kind of touch it. It's certainly good theaters and a, an identical effect on its devotees. Now, Dr. Burt proposes, it's time to acknowledge the breadth and depth of the similarities and declare that yes, theater is religion. Um, on this next slide, um, I just wanted to highlight, uh, I was thinking about a number of plays which I found had a connection to religion, either in subject matter or in the type of experience they invoke. Just on the top uh, left-hand uh, side, Jesus Christ Superstar. I don't know if everybody remembers, but I remember in my childhood that was uh, um, 
an album that my mother played uh, in our house uh, a lot. I actually, that was one of my early acting experiences, which I embarrassingly say, in junior high, I lip synced the part of Jesus uh, in a rather frighteningly awful, I would expect, um, uh, production where we all wore bathrobes and towels on our heads and we lip synced Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, there is a per famous production of a play I think a lot of us read in school of Inherit the Wind, which was about the Scopes Monkey Trial. And it was about the major trial which debated Darwin and evolution versus um, uh, uh, the Bible. Uh, St. Joan by George Bernard Shaw, where she was uh, dramatically burned at the, burned at the stake. Uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, plays and subsequent film was A Man for All Season, which was about Sir Thomas More, fight with Henry VIII that led to the uh, formation of the Anglican Church and the break from the Catholics because uh, Henry VIII wanted a divorce and the Pope wouldn't give it to him so he created his own church to allow him to kind of uh, uh, continue. Uh, sorry, uh, something. I don't know if something happened there. I, I bumped out. Uh, hopefully that's connected. I bumped out for some reason. Um, Sorry, I don't know if I'm back. Can you hear him? You can't. Okay, great. Sorry. Thanks very you. much. Sorry. The um, play was uh, uh, Electra, which is a Greek tragedy that I did in university, actually. And it was. was I remember we made masks out of carpet underlay and uh, chop them up and put over our head. So it was the hottest. Some designer thought this was a good idea and had spirit gum that uh, uh, was connected. So um, I ended that we were all sniffing uh, spirit gum and, and carpet uh, uh, underlay. Sorry, I'm. I don't know what's happening I to my computer. I know I'm not. I, no, I'm not saying anything. Okay. So I seem to be bumping out for some reason. Sorry, everybody. I'm having. I seem to my my computer seems to be popping out here. Uh, I don't know if I'm 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 in, but I'm just praying that I'm I'm in here. Um, well, yeah, I see the participants. Okay, the so, um, so I will assume I continue, and then also the curious incident of the dog at midnight, which was a, a beautiful expression I found of um, the um, uh, connection to the divine. Now there's a, a great quote, um, so I'm just trying to make sure that I can see everybody and uh, look at the chat to make sure. Uh, okay, great, super, thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, from uh, Lenora Inez Brown and uh, from an article in American theater and she describes uh, the experience of theater. And it goes like this. I've always believed that religion and theater have almost an interchangeable effect on the soul. When a play or production works, and I mean really works, one spirit is uplifted and all that is confused seems clearer. Call it a cliche, 
but the experience of great theater is religious. Characters speak to you, to the deepest part of your soul, and somehow the words make it easier to face the troubles of life and appreciate the happy moments more deeply. Now I'm just going to um, There was a uh, great production which uh, occurred in uh, Edmonton. A number of you might have seen it. It was called Hades Town, and it was about Orpheus. It was an ancient myth about Orpheus descending down to hell, where he meets Hades. And the production was um, previewed here in Edmonton at the Citadel Theater before it went to Broadway, and I, and I think a number of people might have seen it and it went on to win the Tony for Best Musical. I just wanted to play here the song Build a Wall, uh, which seems apt for our time, given our Southern neighbor and his aspirations for building a wall. And the lyrics speak strongly to the dilemma facing all of us as we build walls to keep out poverty, which is the enemy, and the growing divide between haves and have-nots. But, uh, you could sit back and listen to Hades Town and build the wall. I don't know why it's doing this. Just one second. Keeps bumping me out here, I apologize. My computer is doing something strange, so I'm going to go back and just exit and re-enter just one second. This is going to be memorable. Um, well, this certainly gives you an appreciation for all the people that can do this effortlessly. Because we have and they have not Because they want what we 
have got the enemy is poverty and the wall keeps out the enemy and we build the wall to keep us free that's why we build the wall we build the wall to keep us free What do we have that they should want? My children, my children. What do we have that they should want? What do we have that they should want? We have a wall to work upon. We have work and they have none. And our work is never done. My children, my children. And the war is never won. The enemy is poverty, and the wall keeps out the enemy. And we build the wall to keep us free. That's why we build the wall. We build the wall to keep us free. And we just have some uh, closing words now, um, going back to waiting for Godot. And I find them hopeful. And in terms of acceptance of our place and time and open to not answering all the questions. I find it very Unitarian actually, in terms of actually being aware of a greater existence but having all sorts of questions. So Coralie's just gonna read this now from Waiting for Godot. But at this place, at this moment of time, all mankind is us, whether we like it or not. Let us make the most of it before it is too late. Let us represent worthily, for once, the foul brood to which a cruel fate consigned us. What do you say? It is true that when with folded arms, we weigh the pros and cons. We are no less a credit to our species. But that is not the question. What are we doing here? That is the question. And we are blessed in this, that we happen to know the answer. Yes, in this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Godot to come. And just to um, uh, close, I wanted to um, uh, play one uh, final note, which is, uh, seems apt for our times, uh, particularly working virtually and different ways of people coming together in community. There was a virtual choir from 31 different countries that was created that actually sang a song uh, from a recent Broadway musical called um, Dear Evan Hansen. And the song was You Will Be Found. And it's about people being alone, but they're able to actually find ways to connect. And it's a Unitarian anthem if, uh, if ever I heard one. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? Well, let that lonely feeling wash away Maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay Cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand You can reach, reach out your hand And oh, 
someone will come running and I know they'll take you home even when the dark comes crashing through when you need a friend to carry you and when you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in cause you'll reach up and rise again Lift your head and look around You will be found 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 There's a place where we don't have to feel unknown And the time that you call out, you're a little less alone If you only say the word From across the silence, your voice is heard Oh, someone will come running Now we uh, will extinguish the chalice. And as the tradition of the, uh, for all our services, um, can virtually join hands and sing uh, Carry the Flame.
Okay, thanks uh, uh, very much for joining the service. Um, if there are any announcements, you can email um, the uh, church at the email above for any kind of church-related announcements and look for the calendar. August 23rd, there's gonna be Imagining City Life. John Pater's gonna be presenting about uh, imagining city life during a pandemic. On August 30th, there is going to be a UCE um, board meeting um, an open at 10.30 on Sunday via Zoom. And there'll be a Nancer period followed by a normal coffee hour and breakout room, rooms. And so all are welcome for that. And also on that date, Westwood Unitarian Congregation are gonna host the national services, which is taking place at 2 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time on Nature in uh, six UU resources. Uh, and then please join us for the uh, coffee hour and apologies for any kind of technical difficulties, but thanks very much for everyone for joining us. <laughs>